Have you ever heard of the secret of eternal youth? Hear it all? No. <laughs> but have you, have you ever heard of that phrase, you know, the secret of eternal youth? Or uh, some people talk, sub, talk about it as the elixir of life, you know. Or the Latins talked about it as aqua vitae. Uh, every literature in the world contains some myth that recounts the story of some hero searching for the elixir of life, searching for some fountain of water that will enable you to go on living forever or that will bring all life into harmony. Uh, it's amazing that countries actually have been discovered by explorers who weren't looking for the country, but were looking for this secret of eternal youth, this aqua vitae. And every literature in the world contains myths about it. The amazing thing is that these corrupted memories that our forefathers had, that there was at one time a secret of eternal youth, that there was at one time some power that would bring all life into harmony and would enable life to be without pain or without disease and without defeat. The amazing thing is that that corrupted memory of theirs did point to the fact that our Creator once did offer us a spirit life that if we received it would make everything work in harmony. It is interesting, you know, that in that situation, it's true, there is no smoke without fire. We often, I think, as we read the Greek and Roman myths, thought, oh, that's foolishness. There's no such thing. Or we saw Midas and how he touched everything to gold. And we sensed, oh, there's no such thing as that. There is no magic power. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, that the literatures of the world are recounting a corrupted memory that was passed on down by Adam to his sons and his sons and his sons that there was at one time such a gift offered to men. And you remember that we've often talked about the real record of that offer that is in this book. How God did offer to us a, a spirit life, an uncreated life, that was better than our physical and psychological life. And this life that he offered us was the very life that flowed through him and his own son. And actually it contained all the powers and qualities that he and his son possess. And God did offer us that, that life and he offered it to us so that if we received it, we would find that our own lives would go harmoniously and would just express spontaneously the beauty of God. You remember that, of course, we rejected it, and we decided that we would rather decide what was right and wrong by the psychological life and the physical life that we possessed. And so we rejected completely God's offer of this spirit life. And you remember the result was disaster. We found that we didn't, in fact, know what was right and what was wrong. And we found that even when we did suspect what was right, we weren't able to do it by the power of our own physical and psychological life. Moreover, we discovered that when we rejected this offer that had been made to us of this spirit life, or this secret of eternal youth, or this aqua vitae that would make everything go right in our lives, we discovered that when we rejected that, a tremendous guilt settled upon us. And we found that we were involved more and more in using our psychological and physical life to try to get rid of that guilt. We found ourselves enslaved by desires to prove ourselves and to gain acceptance from our peers to try to dull the sense of guilt that we had that came from refusing this original offer. So many of us find ourselves involved day by day in just fulfilling needs that we had. Fulfilling needs that we had to be accepted by our, our peers, 
fulfilling needs that we had to be recognized and to be approved of, to be praised. We became so enslaved to the physical needs that we had, the psychological needs that we had, the financial needs that we had, the social needs that we had, that today there are few philosophers or psychologists who will say that we are anything but slaves. And that is the point that we have come to. We rejected this uncreated life because we wanted to be free from depending on any person or any power other than ourselves. And the paradox is that we have resulted in being utterly dependent on all kinds of people for approval, on all kinds of people for our success or our finances or the supply of our food. And so today, most philosophers and psychologists, if they do not express it in as extreme a form as Skinner does, who says that man just is not free and is not capable of being free, at least they say that we are most of the time slaves to deeds and drives that our physical life produces and our psychological life produces. Now, brothers and sisters, we shared before that we got ourselves, in other words, into such a bewildered mess that God saw that we had lost all sense that life could be different at all. And so he started from Noah onwards and he began to set forth in the minds of different men the kind of behavior and the kind of experience that would have resulted if we had received this eternal life. So he began to explain and describe the kind of behavior and experience that would result if you received this secret of eternal you. Or if you received this aqua vitae. And so he would say, now listen, if, if you would receive this life, or if you had received it, you would not commit adultery. If you received this life, you wouldn't steal. If you received this life, you wouldn't tell lies about your neighbors. Because, of course, God knew that this life would give us such a sense of oneness with himself that we wouldn't need to tell lies about our neighbors in order to get somebody else to approve of us or to have a special kind of confidence with us. And he went on and he gave what are really laws of the action of this spirit life. Just you remember as there are laws of gravity that tell you how certain heavy objects behave inside the earth's atmosphere. So he began to describe through different men at different times the kinds of ways that this life would show itself if it was ever received by a man or a woman. And so he said, if you receive this life, you'll love people. You'll have real joy deep down. You'll have a real peace. These are automatic results of this life once you receive it. And so these became known as the laws of the spirit of life. And God gave us these laws, brothers and sisters, so that we would recognize that there was a kind of power that could enable us to live differently from the way we were living. Now, the amazing thing is that he performed a miracle for us. He not only told us the kind of way this life would behave if we ever received it. But for a reason that none of us can plumb or understand, instead of turning away from us and letting us destroy each other with our desire for psychological satisfaction and physical satisfaction, instead of turning away and letting us consume each other, he actually took that selfish will of ours that had decided to do without this elixir of life, and had decided to depend only on itself. And he put that selfish will into his son, Jesus, and he destroyed it. Now that was a miracle, a cosmic miracle that God performed in a timeless, spaceless area called eternity. And what we have discovered is, it's possible for us to have that miracle made real in our own lives by simply believing that our selfish will and our right to a selfish will was destroyed in Jesus 1,900 years ago. And it's possible for us not only to have that selfish will neutralized inside us and that spirit of independence destroyed inside us by God, but it is possible for us again to have a second chance of receiving this secret of eternal youth or this aqua vitae or this supernatural uncreated life that God originally offered to us. And of course, when you receive that, the Bible talks about you as living under grace. 
Because it is just God's sheer grace and generosity that he offers it to us a second time. And when you receive it and live under it, that's called living under grace. Now, dear ones, I think that explanation will help you to understand why Paul answers such a categorical no to the question that is posed in Romans 6 and 15, which we looked at last day. If you just glance at it, Romans 6 and 15. It's page 981, the ones in the black, about 981. Romans 6 and 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. And Paul says, that's absolutely stupid to ask that question. The opposite is true. If you're under grace and you have this supernatural uncreated life flowing through you, actually you can't sin. Because laws that we have here are laws that describe the life of this Spirit. And so if you receive this Spirit, this Spirit spontaneously and automatically exhibits those laws. So Paul says it's stupid to say, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? He says, because you're under grace, because you have this life flowing through you, you can't sin. You'll find yourself automatically obeying the laws that God has given us down through the years to describe the life that this Spirit produces. In other words, really, Paul is saying, the only people who can sin are those who are under law. The only people who can sin are those who are under law. And those are people who are trying to live up to the standards that describe the life of the Spirit on their own, without the Spirit being in them. He says, those people can't avoid sinning. It doesn't matter how hard they try. They're sitting right under law. They're trying to live up to those standards without the Holy Spirit himself. And he says they can do nothing but fail. Loved ones, it would be the same difficulty you would have putting on this miserable Irish accent. You'd really have to strain with it, wouldn't you? You'd have to strain, and some of you could do it better, and I know some of you do it better. But some of you can do it uh, better than others. But on the whole, it would be a strain. It would not come naturally to you. But I, whether you can take a piece of blood and say that's Irish blood, I have Irish blood running through my veins. I have Irish life running through my whole body. So it's no strain for me. Indeed, I can't talk like you, however much I try. So that's the difference, you see. If you have this life running through you, you can't avoid exhibiting the symptoms and the characteristics of this life. But if you haven't this life, it doesn't matter how hard you try. You're going to be living under law. And of course the truth is, That law is not a thing that God intends us to strain and strive to obey. Law is something that he wants us automatically and spontaneously to obey. Just because it is law of the spirit of life. And if you have the spirit of life, the spirit of life will behave in the way that law describes it behaves. Now you might say, okay, is there a situation in physical life that would express that? Yeah, I think there is. If you buy an air conditioner, which you obviously don't need too much today, but if you buy an air conditioner and you read the owner's manual, and the owner's manual describes the performance of the air conditioner on the basis of 220 volt current, but you have 110 volts, then brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how that old air conditioner strains and strives it will not perform up to the level of the standards that are set in the owner's manual unless you have the right power flowing through it. Now that's what it's like with us. Now to take a step further today into today's verse, you might ask, is it as automatic as that? Is it really as automatic as that? That if we reckon ourselves to be dead to self, And if we make no provision for independent life and for exercising our own rights and our own pride, and we bank on God's life coming through us, 
will it automatically happen that we'll obey God's laws? So if we come through some kind of crisis event or some kind of momentary consecration of ourselves to Jesus and readiness to die with him, will it automatically happen that from then on in our lives, the laws of the spirit of life will be expressed through us? And dear ones, the answer has to be no. You can have the 220 volt current available and you can have the old air conditioner present but you have to switch the air conditioner on each day. Or you have to have some kind of thermostat that will switch it on at a certain temperature each day. But it does have to be a daily switching on and off. Indeed, with an air conditioner, you know it's more than a daily switching on and off. So the power is available. And the air conditioner is plugged into that power. And so you reckon yourself dead to self and alive to God. And you bank on God's life and you take that position in your attitude to the Father. But brothers and sisters, there is need for a daily, indeed a momentary, switching off on that, switching on of that power. And that's really what Paul is trying to emphasize to us today, you see. That it's not enough to get into the position where you say, yeah, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm willing to let him do what he wants with me. And then to sit back passively, as some of us do, and say, all right, Holy Spirit, you just reproduce Jesus' life inside me. I'll just sit here. Loved ones, the result of that is unscriptural mysticism and an approximation to the whole guru practices of, of the Eastern religions. It is not a, just a matter of sitting back passively and saying, well, I've taken my stand, now, Holy Spirit, you do the rest. Brothers and sisters, it is necessary to obey the Holy Spirit day by day and moment by moment in your life. It's really to, it re necessary to submit to him moment by moment. Otherwise, you will not see the laws of the Spirit of life exhibited in your own life. So it's very important, you see, for us to see that it's not enough to die to yourself and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is essential to obey the Holy Spirit moment by moment and day by day if he's going to exhibit in you the laws of the spirit of life. Now, that's what Paul is saying in today's verse, dear ones, if you look at it. It's Romans 6 and 16. It's the next verse there. Romans 6 and 16. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. In other words, there's a tendency for some of us to say, well, I have entered into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter too much about the odd wrong choice, does it? Indeed, some say we don't have the right to choose. We just find the Holy Spirit coming through us like a tremendous power, and we just can't resist him. And we end up being loving even though we don't want to be. No, loved ones. The Holy Spirit frees you from the desire to stand up for self, frees you so that you can choose. But day by day, you still need to choose. You need to choose to love instead of to hate. You don't need to struggle against the hatred like you used to do. But you still need to choose to love. You still need to choose to obey Jesus. You don't need to struggle to obey him. But you do need to choose. And there's a tendency for some of us to say, you see, oh, well, surely if we've made the great arrangement with the Holy Spirit and been filled with the Holy Spirit and died to self, surely that's all that matters. The odd wrong choice doesn't matter. Loved ones, Paul is saying the odd wrong choice may not bring eternal death to us, but it will in fact bring something of death into our lives. That's what he's saying there, you see, in 6 and 16. Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to life? In other words, that it is important, he says, why obey sin if you've been freed from sin? Why not obey the Holy Spirit all the time if you've been freed to obey him? And then really the point he's making in 16 is, if you don't do that, if you don't become a slave to the Holy Spirit and obey him moment by moment and day by day, how can you tell when you've crossed the line from being his slave back into being self-slave? And I think that's important, you know. When do you cross that line? And I think a lot of us, you see, say, oh, well, Pastor, now you can't avoid the odd, uh, odd sin. All right, you can't avoid the odd sin. 
Maybe the odd sin God can deal with. If your conscience is still soft enough to repent and your will is still strong enough to submit to God, then God will forgive you for the odd sin. But brothers and sisters, Paul is saying even the odd sin is a serious matter because your every odd sin makes you more and more a slave to that sin. Every odd sin brings something of death into your life. I was uh, concerned, you know, about the, about the importance of, of that statement and I was very anxious to see, all right, well, what about the other theologians? And what about uh, the old Lutheran theologians who, who maybe would tend to say, uh, they would tend to say, well, uh, you can't avoid sinning, it's just part of life and you just have to face it. And uh, you, you just can't get over it. And so Lenski, you know, is, is, is one of the commentators that I use and he's a, he's a Lutheran. And uh, he makes this comment on Romans 6 and 16. Paul does not say that by committing sin while being under grace and not under law, Christians would at once change masters and adopt the sin, their former tyrannical ruler, and leave God their blessed liberator. So that's true. It doesn't mean that one sin and you cease to be a child of God. These Christians want to remain under grace and God. But imagine that grace is not averse to their committing sin on occasion. And it's interesting to hear a Lutheran, you know, saying that. Because so often we like to take some of uh, poor old Luther's other quotations. He has some strong ones that are against sin. But we like to take some of the other ones and quote them out of context and pretend that, well, uh, you can't avoid sinning and act in word and thought every day in life. Well, here's a Lutheran theologian saying, they do not desire the old tyrant, the sin, they think. However, that they may indulge in, they think, however, that they indul may indulge in some measure of sin. But he says, even this is impossible. And then he goes on and says, by obeying some sin or other, we would make ourselves slave to such sin. And this is by no means harmless, because it would be for death, namely spiritual and eternal death. Presenting ourselves for obedience and obeying implies voluntary and conscious stooping to some sin. And we ought to recognize that the fact that the result of this is death. Every sin of this kind has death in it. And that's the point, loved ones. All right, you won't you l lose your eternal security. Or you won't lose your, your life with God. But brothers and sisters, Paul is saying every sin brings death in some form into your life. And of course, he's making the other point that there comes a tricky time when you have to decide, am I being a slave to sin more often than I am being a slave to Jesus? And that's a difficult thing to come into. Um, in Ireland, uh, we, because of the climate and because we didn't get working on TB as early as you did here in the States, most of us have some kind of scar tissue, and I presumably have some on my lungs as a result of the, the, the TB virus, the TB germ. And so, even though the thing is not fatal to me, and is not killing me, and I can breathe, and I'm not spitting up blood all the time, yet still, the marks of the scar tissue are there on my lungs. Now, that's it, loved ones. Every disease brings something of death into your body. Every sin brings something of spiritual death into your life. It brings something of separation from God. Every time you tell a lie, it brings some little bit of uncertainty and insecurity between yourself and God or yourself and a friend. Every time you rebel against God, you have a little more difficulty with the prayer the next day. Every time you miss Bible study in a day, that day is a little more empty. In other words, every sin brings something of death into you. And of course, Paul, what Paul is saying is, all right, when do you cease to be a slave of God? And when do you commit so many individual sins that you're in reality a slave again to Satan? And it's important, you see, to see that. I remember waking up with a jolt one day when I realized that Jesus was not my Lord. I used to say, Jesus is my Lord. He's my master. But I suddenly found he wasn't. I was his Lord. I was his master. I called him in as my servant whenever I needed him. Whenever I was up against difficulties, I called Jesus in. Then I sent him away. And I saw the same thing uh, that I shared with you about teaching. 
I saw that if you're a teacher in a class and there's one happy little soul at the back who only obeys you when it's convenient for him. He doesn't care about you too much. If it's convenient for him, he obeys you. If it's not convenient, he doesn't obey you. I suddenly saw, I am not his master. I am not his teacher. He is my pastor and he is my teacher because he only obeys me when it's convenient. Now, brothers and sisters, a slave is one who has no rights to his own way, no rights to his own success or his own enjoyment or his own power or his own profit, and he's a slave to Jesus. And really, that is the only safe place, you know. A loving, willing, joyous slavery to the Holy Spirit. Somebody has said an instantaneous obedience. That's really the only way to begin to exhibit the laws of the Spirit of life in your own life. An instantaneous obedience to the Holy Spirit. You know, you may sit there and say, Oh, a slave, a slave. I don't want to be a slave. Loved ones, you're either a slave of one or the other. You're either a slave of self or a slave of the bank account, or a slave to your reputation, or a slave to what the success you want to have in life, or you're a slave to one who loves you and who will be kindly and gracious to you because you've offered yourself as a slave. But I can guarantee you, Wall Street will not be that kind to you. And I can guarantee you, the ordinary earthly employer will not be that kind to you. And the bank account is not that gracious to you. So really, it's a question, you know, of deciding whose slave are you? Are you a slave day by day of this Holy Spirit that you have allowed to fill your life? And do you choose consciously what he's prompting you to choose moment by moment? Or are you, in fact, a slave part of the time to self and to success and to reputation? And the phrase, part of the time, is a, an ambiguous phrase. Because when do you si- decide when the slave changes masters? So really, loved ones, it, it just is important. You know. is, there, is there any question? I, I don't think we should push it too long, because I, I know we've been a little late the past few mornings, and some of us are tied to dormitory lunches. There, we, we could have one minute for a question. I, I know sometimes... Nobody will want to ask a question. I know that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think some things are to be obeyed and not discussed. No. No. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are willing to give us day-by-day instructions. We thank you too, Holy Spirit, that coming into death to self and being filled with you does not mean losing our right to choose. It rather means that you bring us into a place where we are at last free to choose. Something we were never free to do before. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have not stolen from us our human freedom, but you have rather given it back to us. And now, Holy Spirit, we see that it is our responsibility and privilege day by day to choose what you guide us to do. And in that way, to become your slave until we come to the place where we do not question you, even where you guide us beyond our own understanding or comprehension. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that that is your plan for us. And we look forward to executing it in our lives today and this coming week. For your glory. Amen.